first one was for, for Chuck Davis um, from our church here. Um, this last Friday was, uh, was a friend from out at Eastside, the church that plants out here, Scott Green. Um, I mentioned him last week, the, the guy who put in our, uh, our welcome center counter out here, built the cabinets downstairs in our, in our kitchen here. And, um, and uh, so, so been at those two funerals. You know, when you go to a funeral, I, I think what happens a lot at funerals is people tend to um, evaluate um, their life. Uh, I think a lot of people do that, begin to evaluate um, th- their own lives. Part of that evaluation, I think, is uh, evaluating what you believe. Um, you know, you begin to, to, to ask, how sure am I about what I believe? Am I confident in what I believe about God? And I think as you, as you uh, um, are at a funeral, sometimes you're contemplating maybe the, even the end of your own life. And, and, and you're asking yourself, how sure am I about what's going to happen when I die? I mean, how sure are you that you're going to heaven? I remember a time in my life when I was young, um, I, I was unsure, you know, and I, I kind of grown up in the church, but I um, um, kind of felt like I was going, you know, kind of going through the motions and, and hadn't fully committed. I hadn't gotten baptized and, and I was very unsure. I, I, and um, it's a terrible feeling. It's a terrible feeling to, to not know, like, well, if I die or if something happens, I don't know for sure if I'm going to heaven. That, that's an awful feeling. And I would say that there are probably some of you in this room that kind of have that feeling. You're not quite sure. It, it's, a, it's a terrible feeling, and it's a terrible thing to be unsure about what's going to happen when you die, or, or do I know if I'm going to go to heaven or not? You know, another thing you begin to evaluate maybe is, um, is kind of how you're living your life. You know, you begin to, to ask, am I doing the things that I, that I should be doing? Am I on the right track spiritually? Uh, do, I, do I know God the way I should know God? Is, is he pleased with me in the way I'm living my life? So if you're somebody who, who goes through these times and, uh, you know, where, where you kind of just need some assurance, right? You just need assurance that you're on the right track in your life. Assurance that you do, in fact, know God uh, the way he wants you to. Assurance that you are going to heaven uh, when you die. If you have those feelings, let me just assure you, you're not alone. You're not alone. I, I believe many Christians have seasons in their life where they go through that. I believe that's been al- always been the way it's been, I, even back into the early, early believers, all the way back to New Testament Christians. In fact, right after Jesus had, uh, had been buried, he rose again, he began to appear to, to some of his followers, and, and word began to spread that Jesus was alive. Well, there was one of his original 12 disciples, Thomas. He wasn't buying it. He didn't believe it. Even though Jesus had told him it was going to happen, he had his doubts. He, he kind of had doubts about what he believed um, uh, about Jesus because, after all, he came to be, um, you know, the, the king of the Jews. He came to set them free, and, and then he watched him die. So he said, I'm not going to believe unless I can see the holes in his, uh, see the marks in his hands. And if I could touch, touch the hole in his hands and the hole in his side from where he was pierced. So Jesus shows up. (laughs) Shows up in the room one day when Thomas is there and says, okay, Thomas, take a look. Go ahead, touch him. Touch me, touch, touch the holes in my hand, touch this, touch my side. And Thomas does, and it says that he, he, he fully surrendered his heart to the risen Savior. He put his full faith in the risen Savior. In fact, it says he said, my God, my Lord and my God. But Jesus goes on to tell Thomas, he said, you believe because you've seen, but blessed are those who, who do not see and yet still believe. And guess what? That's us. That's us. We don't have the luxury of, of physically touching Jesus and, and, and verifying that, you know, the, he has the holes in his hands where he was crucified, but, but we, uh, we still believe. Now, jump ahead 60 years from that time when that interaction with Thomas. The message about Jesus, it's spreading out to all the known world. 
um, at, at, at that time, the, the message of, of Jesus and his resurrection and the, uh, the fact that he, he offers forgiveness of sin and a way to have um, a relationship with, with uh, Almighty God and a way to, to uh, be able to, to spend eternity with him in heaven. Um, and, uh, and this message is going out. But, but as that message went out, the number of people who, um, who are believing without seeing um, is growing as well. A lot of new believers who didn't, didn't sit and listen to Jesus teach, didn't, didn't see him after he rose from the dead, yet they're putting their faith in him, and so this number is growing. Um, in fact, all but one of the apostles has been killed for their faith. John is the only one still alive. And he is um, probably uh, one of, of what would probably be a very small group of people at this time that had seen Jesus after his resurrection. Perhaps he's the only one. We don't know. But uh, there couldn't be too many around that, that uh, had seen Jesus um, after the resurrection. Unfortunately, throughout this time, some false teachings started to, to arise, started to surface in some different areas. Some false teachings about Jesus, some false teaching about what it meant to be a Christian and how to live life as a Christian. One of the false teachings was, um, was Gnosticism or, or what we... Uh, the seeds of what we know today as Gnosticism. Let me explain a little bit about um, what Gnosticism is. It, um, in, in Gnosticism, uh, the belief is that, that all matter is evil. So the physical world, it's all evil. It's the spirit th- that is all that counts. And so they therefore denied that, that salvation came through faith in Jesus, but instead through attaining um, higher knowledge that they had about Jesus. Um, you you kind of see that in a lot of what, what would be called progressivism today, um, that there's now this higher knowledge about Jesus, and that is, that's where enlightenment comes from. That's where salvation comes from, from a higher knowledge, not through faith in Jesus. They denied that, that obedience to God is important because, after all, since the body is evil, what you do with your body doesn't really matter. It's only what's in your spirit that matters. So you can go out and partake in all kinds of sexual immorality. You can go get drunk. You can go really do whatever you want. As long as your spirit stays right with God, then that's all that matters. Because the body's evil anyway. Flesh, matter is all evil. So it doesn't really matter. They denied that Jesus was the Messiah. Uh, the man Jesus was the Messiah. Because he couldn't have been the Messiah because he had flesh and blood. And, and we know that flesh is evil. So they tried to explain Christ's humanity this way. Some thought that, well, he, uh, the Messiah only appeared to have a body, never really actually had a body. He just he, he, he appeared, um, but he was still spirit and had no physical body. Uh, others said that, well, the divine Christ uh, came and embodied the man Jesus after his baptism, but left him before his crucifixion. Because you can't kill the Messiah, he's spirit. Uh, but you could kill the man Jesus because he's flesh. So only from his baptism till right before he was crucified um, was uh, Christ, uh, Jesus the Christ, and was he divine? Today I think we we see some of these elements. Gnosticism is not dead today. It is it has survived through the centuries, and and uh, unfortunately is alive and well in a lot of different forms in our. In our society today, I think, um, you know, the, the teaching that, well, you find truth deep within yourself, right? It's a lot of new age thinking that way. Well, your own truth, you find your own truth. Um, and what's true for me may not be true for you. And you find truth within yourself because that's where it's found. Um, spiritual enlightenment is through higher knowledge, not through a relationship with God or from his word. Because of this kind of teaching, back in, in the first century. Many believers, especially new believers, which they almost all were new believers, they, they were getting confused, as I think people are today. They were unsure of what was really true about Jesus. They were unsure about how to live out their faith in him because it was getting diluted by all this false teaching. A, a lot of false teaching, by the way, that sounds good because you, you maybe use some scriptures, you use them improperly, uh, but it sounds very spiritual. I would say Oprah Winfrey, I'm sorry to have to say this, I think is a Gnostic. Sorry if I offended anybody. No, I'm not. 
It's a teaching that always leads to God. As long as you're sincere in your faith, it all leads to God. It's not true. It's not true. And these, these early believers, they were getting confused. They weren't sure what was true. So in response to what was going on there, John, which, by the way, John was the, the, the person on the face of the earth at that time that best knew what was true about Jesus, wouldn't you say? He was not only one of his disciples that listened to him teach and do all of that and saw him after he, after he rose from the dead, but he was one of his best buddies. He got to not only hear the public teaching, but he got to hear the teaching when they sat around the campfire and when they were walking along the road and just got to observe everything there was to observe about Jesus. This was one of Jesus' closest friends and companions. And so John here, the one who knows the very most there is to know about the truth of Jesus, he writes a letter. We know this letter as the book of 1 John. And he writes it to confirm the truth of the gospel message. And he also writes it to instruct believers on how to live life as a Christian. Here's the truth, and here's how to live out the truth. And, and in fact, in uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, he lays out kind of the purpose. He says, I'm writing this to you so that you may know, so that you may know that you're saved, so that you may know that you have eternal life. So this book, as we study through it, it should give us assurance. It should give us assurance that uh, in, in the truth about Jesus. It, it, it assures us in, in how to live out our faith. It assures us in our salvation. That's why we're calling this series Assurance. How to know that you know God. So I want us to jump in. We're going to uh, read his introduction right now, and, and, and this is going to be good. I'm excited, and I can't wait for us to to begin to, to dig in deeper into the book of First John. So, so let's, let's look. Let's look at the first um, four verses of, of chapter 1. It says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, which we have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, <coughs> we proclaim also to you, so that you may too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. John refers to Jesus there as the word of life. The word of life. Can you think of another place where he's talked about in those terms? John, well, John mentions it in his gospel in chapter 1 when he says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So what does he say there about, about the word of life? I think this is important. He kind of lays a foundation for us about, about Jesus and the truth about Jesus and who he is and what's true about him. And he says right there in, in verse 1, the first part of verse 1, he says that he's eternal. He tells us that the word of life is eternal. He says, that which was from the beginning. Jesus always existed. In fact, John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. In fact, he says all things that were created by him and through him. He was there at the beginning. And since only divine beings exist, pre-exist, John is affirming the deity of Jesus. He's saying Jesus always existed, therefore he is God. By the way, this one thing, this is one of the things, and I think a very important thing, that distinguishes us from the Mormon faith. People often are confused about that. It's like, well, you know, we have Mormon friends, and, and I've got Mormon friends, and they're super nice, and they're all about family, and they say they're Christian call themselves Christians, they say, yeah, we follow Jesus, but I'll tell you something, the Jesus they follow was created by God. Our Jesus is creator. He was not created like us. We were created. Jesus was not created. Jesus was there at creation. He was part of creation. He's God. That may seem small, but that is a very important distinction. The Jesus they follow is not the same Jesus we follow because our Jesus is eternal. John here wants to make sure that we know that Jesus is eternal and therefore he is divine. He is God. 
But I'll tell you, even though he starts off there, that's not really what he wants to emphasize here in the introduction. He, he goes on to say in the next part, he t- tells us that, that the word of life, that Jesus is also human. While Jesus was fully God, he was also fully human. He was 100% God, and he was 100% human. Hard for us to grasp. One of my f- college professors said he was the only 150% person. He's 100% man. He's 100% God. John says he heard Jesus. He saw Jesus with his eyes. He looked at Jesus, which in the Greek means he gazed intently. He watched him very carefully. And then he says, I touched Jesus with my hands. You know, several Old Testament, you know, we look through the Old Testament. Several people in the Old Testament heard God. He spoke to them. Others have seen aspects of God. Moses saw his back. Seen different aspects of God, but nobody had ever touched God. With Jesus, mankind has experienced God in a much more personal way. Jesus was God with skin on. In Greek courts of that day, the testimony of two censors were required for something to be true. If you were going to come and testify of something, you better have seen it and heard it or heard it and touched it, or you had to provide two senses to, for it to, to validate something as true. In fact, even Thomas, right, when he says, hey, I'm not going to believe that Jesus unless I see the marks on his hands and I touch the holes in his hands and his side. But John here even offers a third sense. He says, hey, it's, you know, we, we heard Jesus, we saw Jesus, and we touched Jesus. The important thing here is John is speaking as one who was there. He was there. He's speaking from his personal experience. In fact, man, if we want to hear from somebody about who who Jesus is, this is the guy. I don't know if you, you know, I I like to watch sometimes like uh, on ESPN, like uh, 30 for 30 or whatever, you know, they do the little backgrounds on certain athletes or something. You get to kind of see maybe how they, uh, grew up or, you know, kind of life as, you know, the, as a professional athlete or, or maybe you see, you know, the, uh, the, the shows where they'll, you know, they'll spotlight a certain actor and you kind of get the, kind of get the backstory or when the Olympics come, one of the best part about the Olympics is when they do the backstories on the, on the athletes and you see like where they grew up and how they train and what life is like, um, you know, their commitment level. And I love that. Well, if we want to hear about Jesus, John's the guy. And so he's saying, hey, I, that which was from the beginning, but guess what? I also saw him, and I heard him, and I touched him. So he tells us he's eternal, he's human. The third thing he tells us about the word of life is that the word of life offers eternal life. He offers eternal life. Verse 2, he says, that life was made manifest, and we've seen it. We testify to proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and made manifest to us. The word manifest just means made clear to us. It was made visible to us. We were allowed to see it. Eternal life can only come through Jesus Christ. Eternal life can only come through faith in Jesus Christ. He himself said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Now, there's some people that have a problem with that. And they say, that's, all, that's very narrow-minded. And you know what? I have to agree with them. It is narrow-minded. But guess what? Guess what? The way to salvation is narrow. Jesus himself said in Matthew 7, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And guess what? Many people find it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. And you know something? Only a few are going to find it. Only a few are going to find it. What that tells us is that, unfortunately, most people aren't going to be saved. It's not because they can't. It's not because God doesn't want them to. It's because they're either going to reject the truth or they're going to choose to follow something else. Some of that's because Satan wants to lead people away from the truth. And one of the ways he does it is by convincing them that there's other ways to God. In fact, always lead, always lead to God. He did that in the first century with the Gnostics, and he does it today. There's a, there's a growing belief today that, that all religions actually worship the same God. 
I don't know if you've heard this, but it's like, you know, the, well, the Muslims, they just call him Allah and, you know, um, you know, the Buddhists, you know, they just call him Buddha or whatever, you know, and, um, and, and but it's all the same God. He just revealed himself to different people in different ways. But um, ultimately, we're all going to come together and we're going to see that that we're all worshiping the same God. I got to tell you, that's absolutely false. They can't all be true. The belief that we can coexist under one faith and the demand for a one world religion is going to continue to grow as we continue through the last days. But the Bible is clear. All ways do not lead to God. The only way to heaven, the only way to God is through a right relationship with Jesus Christ. That's it. Eternal life is found only through faith in Jesus Christ. He calls him the eternal life. That word eternal is kind of interesting. It, it, you know, we think sometimes about eternal life and we just think it means forever and ever. And we're kind of thinking, well, I hope it's going to be fun forever and ever. Like if I have to, you know, just sit on the cloud playing a harp, you know, forever and ever, that doesn't sound like too good to me. Um, but but e- the word eternal for an eternal life is is not just mean forever and ever. There's a quality element to that word that is is beyond what we can comprehend. Our eternal life isn't just going to be forever. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. In fact, here's the reality. You begin your eternal life once you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Because now your, your name is written in the book of life and you don't have to face the second death. I'm already living forever. Yeah, my body is going to die and I'm going to go to be with the Lord, but I'm living forever. That's pretty awesome. So the word of life, he's God, he's eternal, he, he, he's, he's human, he offers eternal life. And the next thing he shows us in verse 3 is that, that the word of life allows us to experience fellowship. Allows us to experience fellowship. Fellowship is something we all need. And we do all, we, we want it. It's what we were created for. We were created for fellowship. The word fellowship is a word, it, it's koinonia. Uh, it means to have in common, but there's actually a dual sense there. It first is, it's a participation together in a shared um, activity or outlook. But then the other part of that is, is a unity or a union because of that experience that you have together. And so that, that kind of fellowship, it doesn't, fellowship isn't just, I heard it this way, fellowship isn't just two fellows in a ship. It, just because you're near somebody or, or you're around somebody, that's not fellowship. But it's a shared experience. It's a, it's a shared outlook. And then that unity that you have. Um, I don't know if you ever, like, we're, there's a group of us about ready to go down to Panama. And we're going to meet some other believers from Panama. And guess what? We're, we're, we're not going to, most of us, Francisco will speak their language. But a lot of us won't even speak their language. We come from a totally different culture. But we're going to, when we meet some believers there, we're going to have this unity that is just like, we're, we're kind of just have this connection because, and so when we get together and we're going to worship together, it's going to be rich fellowship because we have that the shared thing together. But there's another aspect of that. Um, because of Jesus, we can have fellowship with God. We can have a personal relationship with God because of what Jesus did. We can know him and we can follow him because of what Jesus did on the cross. But that's not it. And some people want that to be it. And they just think, well, I want to have my fellowship with God. I just don't want to be part of the church. I just don't like other believers or I don't like the church because every church I go to, they're just all jacked up and, you know, they got all these problems. And guess what? You know what? You're never going to find a perfect church. You're just not because it's run by a bunch of imperfect people. But God wants us to have that kind of fellowship with other believers. He knows we need it. He emphasizes the idea of fellowship with other, other believers. Jesus desires us to have fellowship with each other. In John's writing, two aspects of that fellowship, they go hand in hand. You didn't have one without the other. You never just had fellowship with God without fellowship with other believers. And you certainly didn't have fellowship with other believers unless you, until you had fellowship with God. And we miss out on God's desire for us and the blessing that's found in fellowship with others when we don't have shared experiences with other people. You don't spend time with the people at your church. You're, you're missing out on an aspect of that fellowship. 
We need each other. And so you got to be, you got you, you, you come together and you, you worship together and you, you, you do ministry together and you serve together and, and, and you, you go on a mission trip together or you, you begin to, you know, uh, 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 you're in the choir together or you go serve downtown together or, you, you know, you do something together and you begin to experience this fellowship together as believers. And I'll tell you, we miss out on, on that aspect of fellowship when we don't have any shared experiences together. We do need each other, but true fellowship does not and it cannot occur with those outside of Christ. Some people say, well, I've got my spiritual life with God, but I fellowship with my other friends. I don't need friends at the church. I'll, I'll tell you, we need, to have, we need to have friends that aren't believers. We do. But you can't have the same kind of fellowship with them because we're heading in opposite directions. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then, then you're heading towards God. But the Bible's clear that, that those that aren't following Christ, they're headed in the opposite direction. What kind of fellowship can you have with people, that, someone that's going the opposite direction in life? It's limited. It can only go so far. But you know, the next thing is, we need to have, we need to have those friendships and we need to have those relationships because the next thing he talks about is the importance of us grabbing those people and saying, I want you to come have fellowship with us over here. I want you to experience fellowship with God so then, then we can have fellowship together that's deeper and richer and more fulfilling. In fact, it says right there, and our joy can be complete. I believe that part of our joy in Christ is linked to us bringing other people into fellowship with God. He says, he, he's talking about that. He's saying, hey, we want you too to have the same fellowship with us. We want you to fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with Jesus. And we're all going to fellowship together. And he's saying, I, I'm, I'm, I'm writing this so that our joy may be complete. Because you need to come and experience the joy of a relationship with God and then experience his joy with us. And our joy is going to be complete because we got another person to fellowship with in, in the Lord. We got another person that's going to heaven with us. We got to share that with people. We need, like John, to proclaim what we know about Christ so others can experience that fellowship as, as well. The joy is only complete when there's, when there's that vertical fellowship and the horizontal fellowship. And, and I want to tell you, you, if you've never had the opportunity to lead someone to Christ, there's a lot of joy in that. I, I hate to say it, but you, you're kind of missing out on something incredible that that I want to encourage you to pursue. <laughs> because when you get to change etern eternity for somebody, you get to have a hand in leading them to their Savior and, and watching them step from darkness to light, from death to life. There's few things in this life that are as gratifying as that and that are as meaningful as that and that are as awesome as that. There's a lot of joy in that. As we progress through this letter, you're going to see that you can't fully, you can't really fully um, enjoy your relationship with God unless you're enjoying the fellowship of other believers. Because that's the way he designed it. You, you're missing out on an aspect of your relationship with God when you're not enjoying the fellowship of other believers. That's why we exist as a church, so we can fellowship together and, and, and our fellowship is with God. That's God's word of life, seen, heard, and touched in Jesus Christ, our eternal life. Uh, after all, it's what we're going to be doing for eternity. It's what we're going to be doing for eternity. If you're the kind of person that says, yeah, I want to have my relationship with God. I just don't want to be part of the church. Heaven's going to be a big disappointment for you. Because guess what? We're all going to be there. And we're going to be all in your business. And you're going to be like, I want my alone time with God. And we're going to say, sorry, we're all in this together. Fellowship with God and fellowship with each other. That's what God wants for his children, for the church, and that's what we're going to be doing for eternity together. That's the life God desires for us. That's the life God wants to offer us right now. So here's our application for today. Here's what I want you to pull out your notes page. If, if you're not a notes person, and you, that's just usually something to put your gum in or 
write your grocery list on the back of for when you're on your way home. That's fine, but I want you to carve out a spot right now that I would like you to ask you to write something down I- if you're willing to. Um, I, want, I want each of us to begin to compile a list of three people. I, I hesitate to call it our target list. It doesn't always sound right, doesn't have the right connotation, but, but t- our target list of people that we um, know that, uh, that aren't believers yet that we're going to begin to pray for regularly, that we're going to look for opportunities to reach out to and, and share God's love with and, and talk to them about what we, what we know to be true about God. We're going to pray that we'll have opportunities to bring them, to come and see. I mean, uh, I mean during this series, um, through this book, there's gonna, we're going to share a lot of just the truth about Jesus and what it means to be a Christian. It's a great time to bring somebody. And, and I want each of us to, to begin to, 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 to target three people that we're going to pray for and, and ask God to give us opportunity to bring them into fellowship with us. And how awesome it's going to be when you're up here and you're baptizing them, because um, we'd want you to. And unless you just say there's no way, that's fine, I'll cover for you. But, but when, when we're baptizing them, it, it's going to be just an incredible thing. Think about if throughout this series, between now and I'll tell you, it's going to go till about Easter. Actually, it's going to go till the Sunday before Easter, this series through 1 John. Um, if, if, if we each brought somebody, if each of us were able to reach, each one reached one, and, and, and we've got seats right now, <laughs> today we do, so uh, we've got space for them, but man, that Easter celebration is going to be pretty phenomenal. If each of us reaches out and brings somebody into fellowship, man, what an awesome celebration that will be. Let's go for it. Let's make a list and let's begin to pray specifically for those people. And then let's look for opportunities. And I know for some of you, you're thinking, all right, now you're freaking me out because I can't do that. I can't reach out. I can't talk about God because I don't know what to say. I'll say the wrong things. Maybe you will. But guess what? God's bigger than that. (laughs) Trust me, God can overcome your shortcomings. He's done it for me many times where I don't say all the right things. And and then guess what? The people still want to follow Jesus. And they're like, really? I kind of majorly messed that up. And you still want to do it. It, And here's the other thing. Here's the other thing. When Jesus sent out, it was 72, he sent them out two by two. And he said, I want you to go door to door. And I want you to to begin to just talk to people about the good news message. And he said, don't worry about what you're going to say because I'll give you the words when the time comes. You may not know it all. You may not have all the answers. You may be afraid they're going to ask you something. You're going to have to say, gee, I don't know. That's fine. Just say, I don't know, but I'll go find out. And we'll try to find it out together. And then we can go share with them. But chances are, You've been praying for those people, and we collectively begin to pray for those people, and our life groups begin to pray for those people. I, I'll bet you that there's going to be someone on that list that's already starting to ask those questions about what they believe and what might happen to them when they die. And, 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 and good chance God's going to start working on their heart. Remember, we've talked about before, most people give the reason they don't go to church because they've never been invited. So I just want to encourage, let's, let's, let's make a list and let's begin to pray and let's see what God might do as we try to just uh, um, enrich our fellowship, grow our fellowship. And we're going to see our joy just growing too as, we, as our fellowship grows. Sound like a good plan? Let's pray together. Father God, we just thank you. Thank you for your goodness and your love that you sent Jesus to, uh, to come and live life as a human, to become a person. And Lord, although we see in your word that he was tempted and, and uh, he struggled in, in ways, in many similar ways that we do, he still lived a perfect life so that he could die on the cross for our sins. We're thankful that he did. But Lord, we, We praise you and thank you that the story didn't end there, but on the third day he rose again and he's alive today. And we're thankful that unlike every other faith, we worship a risen Savior, a God who's alive. We thank you for the book of 1 John that assures us of that. 
that assures us in our faith, that assures us in our relationship with you, that gives us the assurance we need as we, as we go to try to live for you and, and helps us stay on track. So, Lord, I pray for those in this room, maybe who've never put their faith in you, Lord, I, I pray that they would join our fellowship. They would join your family. I pray for others who are just really struggling with those questions and need that assurance, Lord, I pray this study through 1 John will just give them the confidence to know that, that if they follow your word and they follow your son Jesus, they're going to always be on the right track. Lord, we pray for these individuals that you've already brought to mind. We pray, Lord, that as we as we pray for them, as we reach out to them, as we look for opportunities with them, Lord, that, that you just prepare the way, that you'd be working on their hearts, that your Holy Spirit would open their, their hearts to what we might have to say. I pray for those of us here who are, who are grappling who, who that would be in our life. Lord, put some, put some people on our hearts, even people we might think are the last people that would ever make a decision to follow you, ever want you in their life. Lord, those are some of those most amazing stories. And then, Lord, we pray for courage as we step out and try to reach out to people. Lord, we'd like to see a lot of people join the fellowship. We'd like to see a lot of people come to know you. Look forward to that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's stand and we're going to sing a song that, um, that declares, declares what, we, what we believe, what we pray.